Wheel of Genre, the show for people who like to get down to the bones of the stories they're reading, right into the guts of them. We're reading every short story in Harlan Ellison's anthology, Dangerous Visions, and right now we are on the story that he himself actually submitted, uh, which is The Prowler at the City at the Edge of the World. I'm Zach. This week I'm really interested in, I don't know, I guess what it means to have the editor of an anthology uh, place his own story with within that anthology. In some ways, it becomes almost the most important story in that anthology. And I, I, I don't know. This week, I kind of want to pick apart what what exactly it means. Oh, interesting, Zach. I'm Bob. I'm interested in the violence again. Uh, how is Harlan Ellison's violence different from Robert Block? But Zach, I'm so interested in the introduction. You said the story he submitted. But Harlan Ellison is the wizard behind the curtain. He gets to choose anything. No one is looking at his story. He just slips it in to this anthology. What's your fascination, I guess, with, with Ellison behind the wheel here? I guess it's really a question of what does it reveal about the larger editorial choices? It's difficult to share aesthetic visions. For me, I think if I was going to communicate that vision in any way shape or form the best way to communicate an aesthetic vision about short stories is to write a short story that enacts that vision so i'm not mm -hmm. saying that this does that but i do think that it's worth looking at this story as a kind of like archetypical dangerous vision uh something that we can compare all the other stories to seeing as how it's possible that Harlan Ellison himself was comparing all the other stories that he received in the slush pile to this one. What do you think? Am I reaching yeah. too far or? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm super interested in this question. I was just so happy you said it. I think, yeah, he's the, he's the editor of these. He's pushing people. He's probably telling them to get outside of their comfort zones. Not just that, but pushing them into really dark places, really violent, dark places. And in the introduction where he and Robert Block are kind of writing back and forth in their double introductions to these double stories, the whole thing is strange because Harlan Ellison said, hey, look, Robert Block, I love that story about Jack the Ripper. Here's my idea for an even better version. And then Robert Block says, oh, okay, we're friends. I'll write it. He writes it. Harlan Ellison is not satisfied with it and says, look, can I, can I write the sequel to the story? I didn't really like your version very much. And then still publishes it. It's very strange. It's, it's funny because, I mean, on one hand, there's a kind of like, like we see the creative act as a kind of community endeavor here. Because like you said, Robert, hmm. Ro Robert Block wrote the initial seed story of Jack the Ripper as a kind of immortal killer. His, his murders are a sacrifice to... These kind of Lovecraftian eldritch gods, which make him immortal. So Harlan Ellison said, let's set it in the future. But one of the interesting things Harlan Ellison said was, you know, his vision of, of, of this idea, this creative seed, it didn't, you know, I sent it to him, but he didn't make what I wanted him to make. <laughs> so yeah. in, in Block's version of the story, really, it, it takes place, you know, the entire thing is really in the future. And then only in the last like 10% of the story, Jack the Rent. Jack the Ripper arrives and then kills the people who we've been with, who, who are really the protagonists of the story. Um, I think that it, it will seem clear from reading the story that what Harlan Ellison had in mind, what he wanted was what would happen if you created like a slasher film in the future, like mm -hmm. uh, like Jason goes to space or something like that. Like it seems like what Harlan Ellison wanted to do was just have someone kill people with a knife in a world that is a techno utopia. Uh, aesthetically, I'm not sure what else to pull from this. <laughs> that's about it. That's, yeah. That sums up the story completely. Let's talk about the story for a second. I, I, we framed it now as Harlan Ellison. This is the exemplar story. And if he's not sending this out to people, but if this is kind of the aesthetic or the energy that he's sending out to all of these authors, we've seen violence pretty much in every story. So I think you're right. But this story is the woman from the previous story has been murdered by Jack the Ripper. Now Jack the Ripper is wandering through this uh, utopia 
And Zach, what is what is he doing to this utopia? What is the utopia like? It's a it's kind of a fuzzy story. Well, for fuzzy for me, a strange story. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, in in the way that Har- is really like the characteristic of Harlan Ellison's style, he he tends to throw a lot at you, a lot of ideas, a lot of futuristic ideas. Uh, and it creates this kind of fuzziness because you're not really sure what's important for the plot. <laughs> but uh, so okay, so he gets there. And then the grandpa figure who uh, used his time machine to bring him back from the 1800s into, you know, this year 3000, whatever. He takes him up into the into the future city. And there are all of these other, I guess you could say, denizens of this future utopia. Now, we're already aware that the pop is post post apocalyptic post nuclear war population of Earth has shrunk to about 3000 people. Seemingly all they have left going for them is acts of violence and watching acts of violence for their own pleasure, amusement, boredom. Uh, So they bring him up into the city. Uh, The grandfather character kind of gives him a guided tour. I'm almost reminded of like Virgil guiding Dante through hell a little bit. <laughs> you have a guy. I was thinking tour. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But... <laughs> oh yeah, that's a good one too. <laughs> wow, these connections we make. <laughs> um, <laughs> then uh, they send him back. They send him back to London and have him kill some people. But um, people from the future are in some way, shape, or form within his consciousness, within his brain, watching and viewing and. Um, in a small way, like participating with him in these murders. Um, and then they bring him back to the future once again, where he starts killing all of them. And then it turns out that perhaps it's all an illusion. He wasn't actually killing them, but some kind of virtual reality simulation. It's really, un- we don't get any really solid answers, but what we do end up with is Jack the Ripper seems to be trapped in the future, a discarded plaything. They grow bored of him. And he wanders the streets alone in the future. That's that's pretty much what happened, right? Is there anything I'm missing? Alone in the future. I think that's a big part of what Ellison wants is that image of the alone figure, this figure that's out of place, dirty, smudged, moving through this really clean, but yet kind of evil underneath society. I think one important thing that Harlan doesn't tell us, like he said, it's not cleared up. It's unclear if it's a simulation or if it's really happening because someone shows up He's just killing. It's completely grotesque, way over the top. It's just obscene, lots of these scenes. But Jack the Ripper's killing, 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 killing. Then someone shows up who can just hop through time and space, and uh, he tries to kill her. He can't. Eventually, she says, we're tired of you, and we're going to take all of your power away, and you'll have to wander through this city. So he might really have been killing these people, but these people are so bored, they just don't care, and they want entertainment and they want murder. Reminds me a little bit of Zardoz, where everyone's trapped, and they're in the perfect utopia, and now they're trying to, uh, at any cost, well, I mean, at, they're willing to do anything, even die and murder each other to get out of this um, rotation of just uh, no no progress. They're stuck in a totally static utopia. And I think in this story, it is bloody because they want it to be bloody. Yeah, Zardoz is a good connection. <sighs> I think that there's maybe two strains going on here, two Ellison isms that we can point to. One of which is this, this idea that um, people at their heart, when, when left to their own devices, uh, just want to see violence and gore and in their boredom, they seek out extreme, like extremities. Uh, and he seems to be pointing the finger that this is like an immoral thing. Like he doesn't, so like Ellison, the great, um, uh, finger pointer who says, uh, humanity, I got you, I got you in my sights and I see you for what you really are. But, but then the other strain of Ellison, um, and I, I think we see this in like, I have no mouth and I, and I'm a scream, uh, is Ellison the person where you're never really sure if reality is reality? Like when we have when when we can't decide as readers whether what we've just read actually happened or not, whether it's VR or whether it's real or whether you know it's all a technological illusion. I think Ellison likes doing that because I think that what he wants to do is say, oh, you know how. 
uh, you know how fun it is? You know how weird it is that things in this world, you can never tell if they're actually real or not? That's your world. That's you. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I think <laughs> this is true. like, I think I'm, I'm I'm getting a sense of who Ellison is at this point, I think. <laughs> a big jerk. No, uh, <laughs> yeah. I think you're right. At the very end, when he writes his afterward, which is also a weird experience reading these dangerous visions, he always... Uh, he writes the introduction, but now he's writing his own afterward because finally it's his own story. But he says, oh, you know, I wrote this, this violent story. I wanted to become obsessed with Jack the Ripper and I was spending all of my time researching. Re I fell in love with researching Jack the Ripper right there. That should give you red flags. But he also <laughs> says, <laughs> he, uh, quote, there's a culture that creates its killers and its monsters and then provides for them the one thing Jack was never able to have, reality. He was a doomed man who wanted desperately to be recognized for what he had done, but would not come out in the open for fear of capture. So he, he, he's telling us, okay, uh, as readers, we're creating all of these desires, we're going and we're attracted to these desires, then these fictional characters or people who start to live in fantasy too much who are real characters, but... <laughs> They think they have a message from God like Jack the Ripper does here. And, oh, no, we've done the bad thing. Society has done the bad thing. All of the people reading this have done the bad thing. And he confirms my suspicion that he's, that he's accusing us and your suspicion at the end because he says, that is the message of the story, Ellison says. You are the monsters. And then we move on to the next story. But what? What do you make of that? That is such, like, why accuse the readers? He is the one who has dragged us through all of this. He is the one who has written all of these horrendous things. And he is the one going to the library every day to read about Jack the Ripper and, and loving it. Yeah, it, it, he seems to have this idea that there's, like, like the market demand for violence creates the violent acts, which, um, um, I mean, if that's how, if if that's the message that I understand him to be saying, I, I just disagree. I, I just don't think that holds up. And I think the fact that he, it, it, you know, if this is an argument and the example that he's putting forward is Jack the Ripper, you know, that's a character who we don't really know anything about. Everything we know about this person is pure speculation. He's done a lot of that research. And, you know, from my brief, <laughs> my brief foray onto Wikipedia, he's put in a lot of theories about why Jack the Ripper was motivated. He's put in a lot of theories on the identity and there's Easter eggs in this story that are the products of his research. Actually, one of the things I think is really interesting is that he pulls actual Jack the Ripper letters, possibly fake, but you know, uh, you know, it's it's intertextual. He appropriates the text from real life and places it within his story, and I think that's uh, cool. You know, that's cool. But to get back to what I'm saying, uh, how does this work as an argument when we don't know the motivations of the person that we're talking about, he can say like, like just because he says, Oh, well, we don't really know why Jack the Ripper was motivated, but I say he was motivated because people want violence. Therefore the people who want the violence in the first place are the, are the reason why we have killers like Jack the Ripper. The, the argument doesn't work. It's not a very, he's not a clear thinker when it comes to his kind of high minded moralism. Okay, that's interesting. If if he is just going full violence and he's uh, pulling us along with him, why is he doing it for this anthology? Why is it part of Dangerous Visions? Why is he pushing everyone to be more violent? He's accusing the readers of, oh, you nasty people. Why are you doing this? But he's the one <laughs> who's orchestrating this. And Robert Block, in his introduction, he says, oh, this story is about the violence which lurks within our own psyches. Here, all that is normally forbidden is abnormally released and realized. An obscenity, yes, but a morality, too. A terrible morality implicit in the knowledge that Ripper's inevitable and ultimate victim is always himself. I don't buy that at all, but they're talking about creating a new science fiction, a new wave, as they say, the new wave. They're, <laughs> ooh, what an analysis by me, sorry. So they're trying <laughs> to leave golden age fiction behind and they are um, deliberately doing this violence. So why would these editors, well, this editor and all of these writers want to do that? Why is that necessary to them? You know, I, I feel like every single episode we have this conversation of what makes new wave, new wave. How is it different than golden age? <laughs> what are you? you? Know what? 
<laughs> yeah, every time I feel like I, I give a different answer, but I feel like I feel like in a weird way, uh the new the new wave stories that we've been reading are somehow pulpier than the golden age stories. They're somehow crasser, hmm. more violent. They, they you know, like if you say golden age sci-fi is for kids, well, this is for you know, new new wave appears to be PG thirteen. You know, we moved on from PG sci-fi. And now we got <laughs> oh, uh, far beyond. <laughs> no four letter words. No four letter words. You know, it's not rated R. <laughs> but you know, for thirteen year olds, this is edgy stuff. That that's my suspicion mm. so far. <laughs> my revised suspicion. <laughs> <laughs> this is edgy stuff for thirteen year olds. Okay. Okay, if that's the case, I, I want to look at a couple scenes. You mentioned this earlier in the summary where these six, they, they would be bystanders. They would be people kind of just watching. And it reminds me of the obsession with snuff films and the obsession now with some of the grittier detective stuff where the internet is involved and viewers can watch someone tortured or watch someone killed and they, uh, sm or they hit like or they donate or something terrible. But it makes me feel like that, this scene, because... The grandfather, who is despicable, goes with Jack the Ripper, who is despicable, to go see all of these despicable people. And they do that weird science fiction thing where they jump into Jack the Ripper's brain and they uh, experience all of the sensations of the murder. They, they love it. Uh, they all go there together. It breaks something in Jack the Ripper's brain. But this weird descent reminds me a lot of later New Wave that we've read. For example... It makes me think of Deckard's uh, experience in uh, the Android stream of electric sheep with that empathy machine, mm -hmm. where if you feel something positive, you go into the empathy machine and you broadcast that positivity out, that feeling. If you feel something negative and sad and you feel like, yeah, this is significant for humanity. My, my little tiny suffering is significant for humanity. I'm going to send it out. The, an angle of that empathy machine is the fact that it's a group mm -hmm. activity. Everyone is like right. climbing this hill together. And in here, it is a group activity. Oh, it's a social activity for all these people to watch these violent murders go down. They are engaging in some kind of like group uh, validation, group amusement. I'm not sure what you would call it, but mm -hmm. but they are acting as a as a crew here. No, you're right. They're they're acting as a crew, and they, I guess, they're not ascending anything. They maybe they're descending. Because the grandfather in the first story by Robert Block says, um, I would like this whole little society to end. There used to be 3 billion people. Now there's 3,000 and still that's too many. And they seem to maybe have brought Jack the Ripper here to make sure that that happens. But when they get bored of all of the torture, all of the murder, they say, stop. Maybe it's okay to now have 2,500 people. Maybe we'll continue on living. We've been satiated. We've had enough. So that is also is, I guess, an aspect of that going down, you know, before we were going up, we had like a Messiah character into Android's dream of electric sheep. And now we have a very satanic, well, just evil character bringing society down in population and in uh, morality, I, bringing uh, society down <laughs> is what it feels like. So as SF, how does this comment on the real world? Like what is Ellison? You already talked about snuff films, but like, how would you, how would you put a bow on this of like, Ellison is against what or for what? Uh, people. People. Yeah. <laughs> Ellison hates people. I think you see that in his life. He's mean. Ellison he, hates people. Uh, you it. know, uh, I read he's been, he was divorced five times. And I feel like that is one sentence that will tell you everything you need to know about a person. He doesn't get along well with people. He says again in his. I think it's this introduction or afterward. I don't even know anymore. But he says, I was trying to say something about the boundaries and dimensions of, of evil in a total society, like in a utopia that's enclosed. It was not merely the story of Jack. It was the story of the effects on evil per se of an evil culture. So if you bring evil in, what will it do to an uh, evil culture? Which, of course, looks utopian at first. But if people are murdering and torturing for their own entertainment, that seems like an evil society i think yeah. whatever that quote means is what he's getting at hmm. i mean i see it as a good like uh writing prompt or kind of like aesthetic compass to set off upon your world building and story but uh i mean beyond a, as a kind of hypothetical situation i don't know what i don't know i don't know if there's anything i can kind of like put in my pocket and walk away with 
other than just like, mm-hmm. oh, interesting idea, you know? Um, cool. But I, but I do cool. like, you know, I, I do like your connection to snuff films and like live streaming. Uh, you, you periodically see like really cruel things on TikTok, for example. Uh, pranking culture being like the most uh, mild form of that kind of mean spiritedness. Uh, Ashton Kutcher, <laughs> the little devil. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and maybe, maybe what he's doing is he's drawing out that tendency for us to want to be voyeurs for that kind of, uh, those kinds of interactions and taking it to its logical conclusion of where we just want to see people get butchered up by history's worst killers. I guess I take issue though with the style of the story because when I compare this to Robert Block's version that he he told of this kind of prompt of Jack the Ripper in the future, it's very narrative forward. It world builds, but it worlds it world builds in service of uh, the plot, really. Whereas this one, I feel like, really likes to dwell on the details, almost at the expense of plot. To the fact that you know we have to talk amongst ourselves to figure out what really happened. But those details that Ellison's story likes to dwell upon are all the like gory nasty details it's not enough for him to say oh jack the ripper cut someone it's oh you know he cut medical term for behind the ear and then down the throat and then down through here and then sliced you 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 get what i'm saying he'll he'll go paragraph and paragraph on like a step by step for how to how a serial killer dissects a human body and it's it's kind of um it's kind of gross right it's like to me it feels a little distasteful uh and yet this seems to be exactly what ellison is condemning us for he's condemning us for wanting to watch that but he's the person who's making it who's who's creating (laughs) it so i i'm not i'm not sure i'm not sure what to make of that what do you think of it Zach, but I think before when we've discussed you, you've compared him to a dog in mud. What, what do you think of Ellison? <laughs> what do you mean a dog oh, in man, mud? I remember saying that, but I don't remember the context. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, I think I had said that uh, Harlan Ellison is like a dog that rolls around in mud and then says, "Like, look what you made me do." I I can't <laughs> help but wonder. Um, you know, Robert Block says that no matter what grammatical form that harlan ellison is using he's always writing in the first person so even if it looks like he's writing Mm. in third person in the page or if he's writing in the second person you people are bad for liking this stuff i think maybe we could take what robert block is saying here and apply it to his second person writing because maybe he's pointing the finger at himself as he writes that i like this stuff i like watching this uh this violent smut (laughs) you know i like i like creating (laughs) this so in a sense he's maybe condemning himself i think that's the only way i could possibly read this and 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 make sense of it hmm i think he's he's a bit of a selfish guy he's probably still pointing at us even if we we might think that he's pointing at himself but everything is about himself like all of the introductions seem to be he's talking about himself and it's someone else's story but anyway I, I'm curious. I, I found the science fiction elements of this almost as off-putting as the extreme violence. And the, the violence is not just distasteful, it's disturbing and grotesque and should not be... <laughs> no one wants to read that. But the long parades of sci-fi images are also followed by violent parades and then violent, then sci-fi parades. It goes back and forth. But here's some of the sci-fi. It'll say just long paragraphs of nothing. 1,300 beams of light, one foot wide and seven molecules thick, erupted from almost invisible slits in the metal streets, fanned out and washed the surface of the buildings. They altered hue to a vague blue and washed down the surface of the buildings, then bent and covered. It just goes on and on and on. So this, I'm going to be honest, like reading this and Dangerous Visions has put a really bad taste of sci-fi, like very disappointed in sci-fi. I feel very disinterested in science fiction now. I've enjoyed some, but I feel... If this is what New Wave is bringing to the table, when are people going to fix it? Is this just a disturbance? Is this like a natural disturbance, a huge fire that burns down the forest, and through ecological succession, we're going to have little sprouts 
become the new wave? Does Ellison really have to destroy everything about science fiction in order to start something new? It's a good question. I think I think we've been very lucky because really, as we've done, you know, if we've read through the podcast, uh, we've really stuck to the best of science fiction. Like we've read the best there. Except for Demian. Well, <laughs> Dan Simmons' later work <laughs> aside, uh, <laughs> yeah. So we, we've been lucky in a sense to, I guess, maybe read the exceptions to the rules. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure what to say about it beyond that. Uh, I think that what we're finding here is that. You know, the, the the overwhelming majority of writing within any genre can be quite middling. And when, when we read these anthologies, what we're getting is a much more democratic scoop of <laughs> of the genre. Just be thankful we're not reading the magazines. <laughs> each, yeah, each magazine. Okay, well, as we move forward, I'm curious if it is this democratic process of please send me your work, or if it's more Harlan Ellison whispering in people's ears, going to these conventions and say, hey, I know you've got some dirty secret, write about it and send it to me. It seems kind of creepy what he's doing. So I want to see, is that intentionally what he's trying to do to shake everything up, to break what was what there was before? So I'm curious, how violent will the future stories be? When are they going to start building something? Right now, it feels like a revolution, you know, like the French Revolution, just beheadings disorder lies deceit is that what's going on in the new wave will it eventually build something different and new you know when we associate with that we will eventually associate with philip k dick and zelazny and ursula k Le Guin. when will we feel that it's really good really good questions yeah i was gonna say i feel like i feel like maybe we just have to view this as the embryonic version of those books that we love so much in the later bibliographies of those authors but you know we got uh many many stories to go <laughs> and uh i will not rest until we're done so onward to the next one bob i'll talk to you later talk to you later zach <laughs>